ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Hey there, stacker stack too low. We're sharing big money tips on today's SB show. It's party season across the land, so we're saving you money while parties you plan. Swing your partner. Do si do. Today we introduce party planner Jenny Boss to Mom from a well-crafted party.com. Lots of headlines will bring your way, followed by trivia, another mainstay. Pass your lady to the right. Bow to your new partner. I'll share trivia that'll really shine, and we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline. Right on time. And now, two guys who are celebrating National Square Dance Day. Not as good as this guy, though. Joe and O J J J J G. You're a square dancing fool, O G. Uh, Mrs. OG calls me a square all the time. Good, correct. Square while you're dancing, right? You got the, the, the one OG move, right? When you're forced out on the dance floor. Da -da, that's a, da -da, that's da -da. the one thing. Yeah, I can do the, uh, what's that one where you like walk backward kind of? Oh, not. man. That one? Or do you do the sprinkler? Oh, no. That, well, you do that one usually, so. <laughs> you know what else I do? I like to add to magnifymoney.com using our link so that they know that we sent you there, stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money. When you go there, you'll find that you are maybe not using the right checking account, the right savings account, the right credit cards, the right consolidation strategy. Average person saves $450 when they head to magnifymoney.com. Stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money for a better way to manage your money. We're also brought to you by Roofstock, earn passive income. Let's take a second to talk about how you can start earning passive income by investing in rental properties through Roofstock. They're an online marketplace for buying and selling tenant occupied homes. Whether you're in California or New York, they make it efficient and hassle free to diversify your portfolio and invest from anywhere in high yield markets like Atlanta, Memphis, or now Cleveland or Detroit. They lay all the property reports and financials at your fingertips and even connect you with vetted local property managers for hassle-free ownership. Every property is thoroughly vetted by the Roofstock certification team, so you know it's in good condition and they already have a reliable tenant in place. Best of all, Roofstock certified properties backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Roofstock, property investing made simple. Visit stackybenjamins.com forward slash Roofstock to learn more about rental home investing and browse exclusive listings today. You know, I was just in Detroit uh, over the Thanksgiving Day weekend. I got to tell you, man, running the turkey trot down Woodward Avenue, the you know one of the main thoroughfares, so much construction and so many new places open. Just downtown Detroit Super looks, cool. yeah, looks uh, like that city's coming alive. So good to see that. Maybe a good time to invest in some properties in Detroit through Roofstock. We got a super cool show for you today because Jenny Boss coming down here, OG, and she is square dancing with us into holiday party season. And I got to tell you, I am terrified of the holiday parties. Not a big fan of uh, holiday parties? No. You know, we got the thing about Cheryl's uh, company Christmas party. I'm like, no, thank you. Just don't. You're a mean one. Mr. Uh, Grinch, why, so, why don't you like holiday parties? I don't know, but if you're the person that's been drafted to you do the, I don't, I don't know. I just don't like it. I'm like, no, no, I'll stay home. You go to the holiday party. Okay. I, you, you, you end up uh, talking to somebody that you're mildly interested in talking to. You know, mm. you know what I mean. Hey, how about the market? Hey, Any good stock tips. Yeah, great. How's that little uh, uh, podcast project of yours working out. You guys, uh, you guys got some people that listen to the show. Right. Where, where can I find it at? <laughs> So I heard you got a great blog. You're not on the radio yet. Where, I've, been, I've been listening to the radio. I haven't heard you. Where do I listen to your blog? I would love to listen to your blog. Yeah, not great. But if you're the person that got drafted to do the holiday party this year to put it on, Jenny Bost is going to help you do it for less money and make it the world's best party. And if you're somebody that uh, goes to parties to uh, know the etiquette, like, um, you know, which fork to use. Or how many 
Little, those little uh, weenies you can put in your mouth at one time and and still carry on a conver- still carry on a conversation being inappropriate <laughs> i think you put one of those in your mouth you're inappropriate but let's move hello darlings and now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking benjamin's headlines our first headline comes to us from the wall street journal firms cut buybacks as stocks become expensive this by ben eisen and chris diederich you read this uh, no, no, I don't uh, subscribe to fake news. Not a bit, not a brick. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal is such, such fake news. <laughs> Large companies are purchasing their shares at the slowest pace in five years as record U.S. stock indexes and expanding economy propel more money out of flush corporate coffers. And listen to this into capital spending and mergers. Companies, OG, they have been buying back shares right? Makes them safer for management, build up a little moat. And now they're starting to deploy that money. That's, that's kind of exciting to see. Well, yeah, what they're saying here is that they don't, uh, when they do their cost of capital analysis, they're finding that it's a better use of the capital to repay shareholders with dividends and also uh, use that money to add capital projects that increase revenue and, and, and go after uh, weaker, acquisitions. Yeah. Weaker companies. We're gonna, As opposed to buying their own stuff. Yeah, we're going to see some takeovers coming, it looks like. It's not surprising, I guess, with the stock market at a all-time high every day, it seems like, that, uh, well, and that's that companies are. And, and that's actually funny that you say that, because I'm thinking myself that if I'm reading this, I, I read stocks becoming expensive, firms changing things. Oh, I should probably stop investing. I should probably slow down my investing strategy. Yeah, no. No, no. Because what what happens when there's mergers? We see stocks tend to go up when we see lots of mergers, don't we? And then we also, when firms invest in making better products, more innovation, we're wringing the towel, man. I mean, there's there's a bunch more. But then again, I wouldn't do the opposite thing. And if I haven't been investing, I wouldn't go out and say, oh, this shows me that things are going to get even better in the future. Like, I think this is this is all great news. This is fantastic news, and it needs to see companies pivoting. But in terms of our individual plan, I don't think it changes things. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the individual companies do. And the other thing, too, is that they're using really sophisticated analysis to figure out their maximum cash strategy. They're at the margin here of, you know, we can get 15% if we buy our own stock or 15.5% return if we build this new factory. So we're going to take that extra half a percent because we're we're deploying a billion dollars and that really matters. Investors though tend to like the share buyback programs though. Why is that? Cuz it doesn't I mean, you, you know, it reduces not, the number of shares outstanding. Yeah, so meaning by, by default there's less of it, so yeah. uh, supply and demand uh, takes effect. Fewer shares makes my ownership interest uh, more valuable. Right? Yep. Yeah. Good stuff there. Now, do you like buying individual shares of stocks versus buying an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund? No, no. All of our uh, kind of family uh, financial planning stuff is all in mutual funds and ETFs. And the kids, you know, I mentioned on a show, I don't know, a week ago or so that that we use Stockpile because I want them to understand that they're owning parts of companies. And, you know, it's kind of hard to understand that when you're eight and ten unless you see the name, you know, so we let them buy individual stock, but we're talking, you know, $300 worth total, you know, between the two of them. So, and I suppose if there was something that caught my eye, I might throw a few dollars at it, but I'm, I'm too, uh, am I too stupid to pick individual stocks maybe, or maybe too smart to pick individual stocks? I was going to say, I think you're too smart to pick individual stocks. I'm one of the two. I don't know. Yeah. Depends on, uh, depends on who you're talking to, I guess. Second headline comes to us from USA Today, uh, this written by Chris Woodyard. Deal hunters, don't forget car showrooms. We always talk about when people are buying cars, the uh, the smart thing to do is to buy a new-to-you car versus a new car. Last week, while many shoppers headed for the malls on Black Friday, some headed to auto dealerships instead. Whenever it comes to holidays, auto dealers typically sweeten deals to draw out the buyers. Number one, you've got incentives at the car lot. Automakers pile on sales inducements. Number two, closeouts. At the end of the year here, you're seeing more auto dealers that offer closeout deals. They're trying to get rid of last year's stuff to make room for next year's things. And then, obviously, at the end of any month, that's the best time to buy your car, right? Yeah, sales incentives for the for the sales guy. Yeah, sales guys got to make a sale, so they're going to give you the best thing possible. 
And then demand shift. I thought this was interesting. Buyers have made a dramatic shift to SUVs from cars. In October of this year, SUVs made up nearly two-thirds of vehicle sales. Auto data figures show car sales were down 9.2% for the month, while SUV sales up 36 compared to the same month last year. Looks like uh, maybe as gas prices continue to stay relatively consistent. Yeah, we ended up buying our, uh, you know, we got a minivan. It's the greatest thing we've ever owned, according to... Uh, Somebody. The Toyota dealer. And... Uh, <laughs> Right. If he does say so himself. <laughs> uh, but we got it on December 31st. I think we signed the papers at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Dude. I mean, the kick I was sweating. Salesman sweating, sweating the whole time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we were at a Toyota dealer and uh, we're test driving some cars. Didn't end up buying the new car. But it was funny because um, this woman at the end of the month kind of sweating with us too. Putting mm-hmm. a little pressure on after we, we revisited for the second time. Decided that that wasn't going to be for us. Well, and this is a good time. You mentioned the closeouts and the model year change and that sort of thing. There's a great chance right now that there's, so it's the end of 2017. We're moving into 2018. The 2018 models are already on the, on the showroom, right? 2017 models are, there's probably 2016 models still on the floor. You know, either two model years off, but they're probably, you know, still brandy new sitting out there. These, these, those are the ones you go after. I think for some people buying a new car makes sense, but for the vast majority of people, oh gee, it's still the used car no matter all these incentives, could often still score a much better deal. You get rid of that natural depreciation that you see on, uh, you know, when a car drives off the lot, it depreciates a ton. I just think it, I don't know. Still, I read this article in well, USA Well, the interest today. rates aren't too bad between new and slightly used anyway, so you're not making any big difference there. Right. No, no. Especially if you keep that loan, low number low. So I think uh, the lesson here is don't forget showrooms when you're searching for a new to you car. And especially if you shop at the end of the month, I think it's going to look really good for you. But the uh, the other lesson, stock buyback programs, great for shareholders, but don't let that change your financial plan. Well, here's the problem, OG. It's your turn to host the holiday party, which means your December budget's blown already or... You're headed off to a party. You're not sure what the heck the party etiquette's all about. Well, guess what? We got you, your wallet, your reputation covered. Jenny Bost is a woman behind the awesome party planning site of Wellcrafted Party. Not only has she planned many a party, but her site shares lots of money-saving tips. And we're going to grab as money as money. I love that. As many from her as possible. I know. From her as possible today. Let's say hello to party planning expert Jenny Bost coming down to the basement. And Jenny Bust coming down the stairs. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? Well, I'm good, but I feel like, you know, for a party planner like you, I feel like the basement is a little underwhelming. That's okay. I, I brought some snacks to make things better. <laughs> that is perfect. That's fantastic. Well, you're somebody that I'm sure has been to just some absolutely horrible, horrible holiday parties, haven't you? Well, haven't we all? Right. Good point. Yeah, the worst party I've ever been to, I walked in and the host was still in the kitchen. Oh, no. Got a couple pans on the stove, trying to get everything done. All the guests are asking if they can help. You can tell she's clearly stressed. That never, Go ahead. well, yeah, that never helps either, does it? I mean, because I know there have been times when I've run home and uh, you're trying to get a party together and everybody crowding around going, can I help? Can I help with anything? You're like, please just, just go away. Yeah, sometimes it takes more effort to tell them what to do than to just do it yourself. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I'm sure the horror story doesn't end there. No, no. Um, the, the whole night, the host was just trying to get everything cleaned or bring out more food or you know make sure everybody's drinks were great. And I don't think that she enjoyed herself the entire time. And so it was just very clearly uncomfortable for everyone. Oh, no. Man, that must have been horrible. You must have felt bad for her. Yeah, especially since the hostess was me. <laughs> well, that's, that kind of changes changes everything. But, you know, it's funny. You're not having any fun. Your guests aren't having any fun. I mean, what a flipping nightmare, Jenny. 
No, I mean, I've been throwing parties for years and years and years. And of course, every party is different. But that party in particular taught me to just let things go. And it also taught me what a lot of people who don't throw parties a lot go through whenever they're trying to host for the first time. Is that the biggest the biggest lesson with holiday party planning? Don't try to be perfect. Exactly. I mean, there's no point to it. Nobody's going to be perfect. There's going to be issues that come up and you're not going to be able to just, you know, spend the moon and the stars to make a party perfect. So it's all about what to let go and what to put your effort into. And I think it's important to realize, too, that everybody wants you to win. You know, I keep reminding myself that when I give a party, like everybody just wants to have a good time. They're not looking for, you know, the perfect ice sculpture and the 10 piece band, you know, like exactly, (laughs) especially holidays. You know, like there's so many opportunities for parties. If they chose to go to your party, it has nothing to do with what you're serving. It's all about you. So, yeah, no, that's great advice. Well, you've been nice enough to give us some tips to prepare some tips for our audience to make things a little less stressful. And maybe then we can talk about maybe even saving a few Benjamins. But uh, how do we get through this if we're trying to throw a holiday party and without losing all our hair? My biggest tip, and I think this has come with age, is learn what to outsource. You don't have to do it all. Yeah. And so for me, that would be everything. (laughs) Yes. And so for some people, that's absolutely the way to go is just to outsource everything. Um, Some people enjoy doing one or two items um, like you've got hosts that really enjoy cooking, but hate to clean. And that's where I would fall. And then the other hosts who really, really don't know how to even whip up a pizza if they had to but they really like to decorate. And so it's finding what you enjoy doing in the party realm and then outsourcing the rest. And of course, you know, you have to stay within your budget. So just really figuring out what's going to help you the most. That was that was my next question was about the budget, because when it comes to that piece, I mean, if you outsource everything, that party can go from not costing much to being hugely expensive. Exactly, for sure. That's why I typically pick one or two items that really take a lot of time and a lot of effort on my part, because I can spend that time and effort doing something else that's more enjoyable or to make a few dollars to help pay for the party rather than spending the time doing all those things. I usually always outsource my cleaning. I really, really don't like cleaning. And so I hire somebody to come in and clean the day of the party before everybody gets there. No, that's great. What about asking guests to pitch in, you know, like having a potluck style party? Is that is that is that rude at a holiday party or is that socially acceptable? You know, I don't think so. I don't think it's rude. I think that um, it's all depending on who you're inviting. Some of my friends, it's just status quo. We always bring stuff over. It doesn't matter. So know your crowd, who you're inviting over. Make it clear on the invitation. If it's a potluck, usually nobody cares, but they don't want to show up to a potluck empty handed. So make sure it's clear that it's a potluck and that you're expecting everybody to bring a dish. I want to ask you also, before we get to more points about hosting a party, if I'm attending a party, what are some of the the etiquette things that I should make sure that I do? Well, it's kind of gone out of style, but one of the big etiquette things is bringing a host gift. What really works well is to grab a bottle of wine from the store and bring it to the party. If the guest wants to open it up at the party, they can. If not, they can open it up while cleaning later. (laughs) That's that's right. 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 Even with the paper bag still around it. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Well, let's talk about uh, cutting corners and, and making things work with your budget. What are some ways to plan the perfect party and still, you know, fit it into a rather tight budget. Sure. So I think that you can limit your options on food and beverages. Okay. That will decrease stress a lot because you don't have to go crazy trying to figure out all the different options that your guests might like. But also guests aren't really that picky. You don't need to have a Pinot Grigio, a Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir and a (laughs) You know, you just don't have to have all those different kinds of wines. You can pick your favorite red house wine and a favorite white house wine and just serve those. Don't pick out a whole bunch of different kinds of beers. Pick one or two styles and put those out. And most of the time, people just want something in a cup to hold while they're talking to friends. (laughs) Very much so. Yeah. Um, One of my favorite things to do is do signature cocktails. Instead of stocking an entire bar, which can definitely rack up a huge bill, just do like a punch bowl full of a great 
punch or a um, batch cocktail so that you don't have to sit behind the bar all night, but your guests can have a really good cocktail in their hands. That's a that's a great idea. I remember going to a tailgate one time and, you know, they had the regular things you have at a tailgate, but the hostess at the tailgate, Jenny, made these things. It was a an Arkansas Razorback game and she made these things called hogaritas. And they were margaritas that were either all red with a little dab of white or they were all white with a little dab of red. And I remember thinking that just having that one signature drink really made the party instead of having 15 different drinks. Absolutely. Everybody wants to try it and having something like naming it like a hogarita just goes a step above is probably a strawberry, strawberry margarita, right. you know, it, it's something super simple, but just changing up the name and making it special goes a long way. What about the, what about the non-alcoholic drink options? Are there ways to spice up those too? Yeah, for sure. I always have a carafe of water. Um, and then I put in things like fruit or mint, cucumber, those type ah. of things. And also like sparkling waters. They're really in right now. Um, they look fantastic and everybody loves them, but they're super affordable. My business partner, Kathleen, gets sparkling every time. And I think of her as the most foo-foo person I know because of it. <laughs> and they're really not, you know, they're super <laughs> affordable. So. so that's food. Anything else when it comes to food? Appetizers. You don't have to have a million appetizers. You don't have to hand make everything. If you're doing a cocktail party, I'd say three to five appetizers per person and make sure you have three to four servings per person. And my biggest tip is grab something from the store. Do a nice meat and cheese platter or pick up some of those lovely boxed appetizers from Trader Joe's and throw them in the oven and you're done. And everybody thinks it's fantastic and that you made it from scratch. Just put it on a new plate. Yeah. And don't tell anybody. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The secret's safe. Nobody listens to the show, Jenny. So nobody knows that tip anyway. <laughs> and now when it comes to decorating, you know, you, you might want to decorate for the holidays. Any tips there? Sure. I, I love to use printables for decorating. There's so many different ones online, or you can make them yourself. Just to put food labels out, those type of things connects the whole party. That and really fresh flowers is all you need. Fresh flowers put out and it looks like a party. I don't even, I don't even know what printables are. What are printables? They are designs created. A lot of them are free or super, super cheap that you can print off at home on your home ah, computer. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. And then anything really holiday specific that, you know, maybe makes it feel extra December-y maybe? My favorite part of the holidays is the decorations are built in. You have your Christmas tree up. You have ornaments everywhere. Just put those around the house. Put them off the tree. Even for New Year's, you can keep those things out and it looks really festive. Once again, more doesn't equal better. You, you've already got exactly. it built in. Yeah. Calm down and just, just get it done. <laughs> right. Any tips then about the serving ware? You know, we see these people that go and they invest tons of money in, in, you know, stuff with Christmas trees on it or things that have holiday decorations. Uh, should I go buy a bunch of those? I don't think so. I think that the best way, especially if you're entertained often, is to get some really reusable items, white, clear, those type of things. They'll be good for any holiday that you're going to celebrate. Likely, you're not only going to throw a um, holiday party every year. You may have a birthday or two that you want to celebrate. So just investing in some simple, affordable pieces. I really like that a lot of the big box stores are now doing entertaining sets. So you can get 12 white plates or 12 stemmed glasses for a really great price. They come in boxes that you can store them in. But the best part is because they're so affordable, if they break, you're not going to be super upset about it. Do you play any games or activities when you have people over or does the party just kind of flow? I do a little bit of both. I, I don't like going to parties where they have really structured games, but I do enjoy whenever there's some card games out or board games, depending on the crowd. I really like games like Cards Against Humanity, um, <laughs> those types of they really bring a crowd together and it helps break the ice. But mostly just have great drinks and food put around the room instead of just in one area. And people are going to mingle quite well. I like that. So if it happens, if the board game happens, the Cards Against Humanity happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't because you were having fun without it. Absolutely. Yeah, gotcha. Now, all right, I'm attending a party. I don't know flipping anybody. This is like the nightmare scenario. I'm new to the neighborhood. I walk in. How do I, how do I get into this holiday party? Or I'm with my spouse at a work party, right? With her and I'm, you know, I'm the second fiddle. Any tips for those people? 
definitely greet the host first. They will be the one to indicate who you should talk to and get the ice broken. But in general, you just grab a plate of food or a drink and you step up to somebody else who also has food or a drink and start talking about what you're eating or drinking. And then it moves on from there. That's a great tip for hosts too, by the way, I think, is that I've been to plenty of parties where I hope the host would do that and they didn't do it. And then I felt lost. Like if, if I'm hosting a party, it really is my job to make sure that those people that look like they're not having fun, that I get them involved. I think that's the most important part of the host. It's also the part I struggle the most with because I am a nervous wreck around new people, (laughs) um, which is hilarious to most people since I throw so many parties. But uh, my husband is fantastic about meeting and greeting people. So I kind of feed off him. As a host, it's really your job to go out and make your guests comfortable and enjoy themselves. One um, thing that I like to do that helps me as a host to to really engage with people is some, I, I choose one or two appetizers as a past hors d'oeuvre and I walk around with a tray and get them to try new things. And that gives me an opportunity to not stand and talk to one person the entire time, but also um, have them engage with others around them. What a great idea. I mean, for you, it's a prop and a crutch all at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, that, and a glass of wine. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And if it's a glass of wine number five, the conversation gets really <laughs> interesting then. It's funny that the site is called A Well-Crafted Party. I love your website, by the way. And you've got a ton of ideas here uh, for the holidays. I know you've got one on holiday party tips, a video, holiday drinks roundup, holiday party food roundup. You're making me hungry already. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoy sharing um, tips to make everyday celebrations a little bit more fun, but still not break the bank. Right. And and that's primarily what you do at the site. What else is on a well-crafted party? Um, my family. I think that life is a bit of a party, so we should celebrate all about it. And so I do a lot of posts about where I live, Portland, Oregon, and about my two boys and their crazy life. So it's a lot of fun on there. Yeah, I love it. It's a combination of your life and ways to be the best party planner ever without breaking the bank all wrapped into one. Yes. I really enjoy getting to write on there. But one of my favorite things is I share a lot of free printables. So if you need to ah, there they are. for what that is. Yeah. So if you're going to a potluck, I have a thing that you can print out and put against each of the uh, dishes in the potluck so you can see what ingredients are in it. Or I've got a few invitations on there that you can just print off and use. So. Awesome. And we'll link to a wellcraftedparty.com on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. So if you're walking the dog or on your way to work or whatever, we've got you covered. Jenny, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you so much for having me. Hey there, Money Nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just got back from Joe's mom's holiday party with her bridge club. What gift did I get? How about Texarkana, a story in pictures? This book is six pages long. Seriously, I think I might try and re-gift this thing, which brings up today's trivia question. In a recent survey, what percentage of the population thinks re-gifting is socially acceptable? I'll be back with the answer and maybe some paper to wrap up this and give it to OG in just a minute. All right, raise your hand. Do you drive an extra five minutes in traffic to save just a few pennies at the gas pump? Well, when's the last time you spent five minutes trying to save on the big things like auto loans? Lucky for you, we brought in Nick Clements from Magnify Money with a few tips on saving money if you find yourself financing a car. If you're buying a new car, there's really no better deal than the 0% financing that would be offered by the manufacturer. The issue really starts to happen if you don't qualify for the manufacturer's financing or you're buying a used car. And in those cases, I, I think it's a very good idea to always shop online and get a low rate before you walk onto the lot. Uh, chances are high that the dealer will beat it, but if you don't walk onto the lot with a low rate to begin with, you know you won't get the best deal. Thanks, Nick. More than just auto loans, Magnify Money's the perfect spot for reviewing just how well or not your checking and savings accounts are performing. You might just decide to switch banks, and guess what? Why stick with just one bank at all when you can use magnifymoney.com to always find best-in-class stuff? Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnifymoney. Average person saves $450 in interest when they go there. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnifymoney. Here's a question. What's keeping you away from investing in real estate? Over my career, I repeatedly hear that time 
you know, the time it takes to find renters, property managers, and to fix problems and stress. What if you don't find a good property manager? What if you don't find a renter? Those are two of the biggest factors keeping people away from investing in real estate. We talked to Gary Beasley, CEO of Roofstock, about how the team at Roofstock are helping you take back a good night's sleep. There's really no way to sell real estate today, rental homes with tenants in place. What we did with Roofstock was create the first way to do it. How's that for an advantage? Roofstock's online marketplace makes it easier than ever to buy, sell, and own tenant-occupied investment properties in top rental markets across the country. You own the house, but Roofstock handles as much or as little of the headache-inducing issues that you've come to expect with renting, but that doesn't have to happen if you partner with the right team. Best of all, Roofstock certified properties are backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Check them out at stackybedjamins.com forward slash Roofstock. That's stackybedjamins.com forward slash Roofstock. Hey there, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Unlike other podcasts that might re-gift trivia, we don't do that here. It's fresh out of the oven, baby. Here was today's scrumptious holiday morsel. What percentage of the population thinks re-gifting is acceptable? The answer? In a recent survey, a full 92% of people said that re-gifting was fine by them. When asked specifically about re-gifting the book, Texarkana, A Story in Pictures, I'll bet that went down about 12%, but I'm going to do it anyway. See ya. That's the book it keeps giving, OG. Yeah, yeah it is. It's and no, I don't want it, Doug. All, all six pages. Well, you're not a big reader, so that, that would go great for you. I'm not a big reader, yeah. But re-gifting, a lot more people think that's acceptable than you thought. You were done around, what, 22% you said? Yeah. Apparently, everybody re-gifts except the OGs. Yeah. Well, you know, we have original gifts. Right. Get it? Get Ori- it? Original skills? Original gifts. Like OG. G- GIFs? Come on. Try and... Original gifts? Oh, man. That's so bad. Hey, let's skip that and throw out the Haven Lifeline so we can tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they've been spearheading innovation within the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things, OG that you value most weak old pumpkin pie and those little oranges that you suck out of the jello <laughs> so you don't have to eat the jello like grandma's yeah grandma's jello those oh, are I love it. uh or either that or your family and your time that's why they created a high quality most importantly affordable term life insurance policy issued by mass mutual you can purchase entirely online no need to wait several weeks for a decision when you can get one bam instantly with Haven Life, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and learn about life insurance the modern way. They just opened up in California. California, welcome to Haven Life. You can now onboard to Haven Life too if you want. But today, we're onboarding this call from our new BFF, Kyle. Say hello, Kyle. Hey, Joe and OG. This is Kyle from Southern Illinois. I have a question about the moral implications of credit cards. At a recent outing with friends, I was accosted for not having a credit card, even though I'm 31 years old, and never planning on having a credit card. Even as a financially responsible person, I don't believe in using credit cards because the benefits they offer, that money and value, even if it comes in the form of airline miles or reward points, that value came off the backs of others who are less fortunate or less responsible than myself. And I just don't believe in using that sort of usury. Um, Am I wrong in that belief or is there, is there something more going on that I just don't understand in the industry? Thanks guys. Hey Kyle, thanks for that question. Who goes up to somebody at a party and goes, you don't use credit cards. What's wrong with you? (laughs) Yeah. I hope you really weren't accosted. That sounds like a pretty violent encounter. Kyle, I got to defend myself. I had seven drinks of me at that point. (laughs) I'm kidding. There's no way. All that eggnog sloshing around (laughs) in your belly. (laughs) Yeah. The the problem is that it's even worse than that, right? Remember the days of uh, you go get gas and it would say cash and credit with two different prices? Yeah. Right? And now it's just one price. Why? Because 
they just add that 3% swipe fee on top of it. So it's not just that it's born on the backs of irresponsible people or people less fortunate. Everybody bears the cost of it. And it causes arguably a lot of goods and services to cost more. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with not having a credit card or not ever planning on one. There are obvious benefits to it. There's obviously uh, things that are that are detrimental to it as well. The only thing I would add is just be aware of the limitations of cash and debit cards across the landscape because, you know, you got to be aware if you try to rent a car and use a debit card, it's a little more difficult, although there's ways to do it. Try to get a hotel room, a little more difficult, you know, just an extra hurdle you have to jump through. But if you've done it a bunch before, it's nothing new to you. So, you know, no big deal. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I have an opinion on this. I think it's it's important for you to be authentic about your beliefs and live according to your belief system. Yeah. And why somebody would jump all over somebody else because of their belief system is still beyond me. Like yeah. I, you don't want to use a credit card? No, no, yeah, okay. don't use one. Yeah, don't cool. use one. Nope, nothing wrong there, Kyle. Keep on trucking, man. And uh you know what? The good thing is the chance of Kyle getting into credit card debt is zero. Kind None. Of slim. And what's the biggest problem that you and I see over and over and over when we answer questions on this show? Credit card debt, followed probably by student loan debt, which, you know, when you look at the numbers, actually, student loan debt's a bigger problem. We just feel more, I think we feel more credit card questions than we do. Uh, people, feel, people feel better about their student loans. Yeah. They feel like there's something at the end of that rainbow. Sadly yeah. mistaken. <laughs> yeah. Wanna, well, no, I mean, there can be, and there's good uses for it, but... Um, I know, I was but, joking. But you kind of... You kind of can justify it a little bit more than, you know, that sweater from J. Crew six years ago. Well, that's a heck of a sweater. What if it's a heck it of a sweater? A heck of a sweater. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Kyle. We also get letters on this here podcast. Doug just brought down the mail and let's crack this one open from Travis. Travis says, I know you guys love a good rule of thumb. You can already tell from the beginning of the letter that Travis is baiting us with that. We love a good rule of thumb. <clears throat> I recently read about something called a 20% rule of investing. You ever hear of that one, OG? No, I'm listening. Here we go. From what I understand, it says that if a stock goes up 20%, it's time to sell the stock and, quote, lock in those gains. To me, this seems like an attempt at market timing. It could cause you to miss out on more gains. On the other hand, it could prevent you from riding the stock back down to break even or a loss. Have you heard of this? Interesting to hear your thoughts. Or Doug, since he's a smart one. <laughs> Thanks, Travis. Got to get uh, Doug involved there. No, we 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 like Doug bringing down the mail, not answering the. We don't want Doug to show us up. He can't so, even open the mail. He gets like the paper cut. <laughs> He's trying to. Uh, uh, what have you, you ever heard of this? I've never. No, I guess, no. I in theory, there's some variation of, you know, a rising stop loss type of deal or something like that. If you have individual stocks, but why would you want to stop at twenty percent? What in could, theory, the person who invested in 1942. Got their 20% out of the way by what, 1946 or 48, and then hasn't invested since? Like, when do you come back in? That, that was my big question for Travis is okay, I get getting out, maybe, probably not, but maybe. But Sounds easier than said than done. Yeah. Yeah. Just when, when, when do you get back in? Cause if you get, well, if, well, I think you have to wait for it to go up another 20% before you get back in. <laughs> right. And then you and then you wait for it to go down twenty percent to get back, back out to the original price, and then your weighted cost basis is even. Yeah. So then there's no capital gains. Oh, my head hurts. It's a, it's a capital gains strategy, net neutral strategy. <laughs> net neutral. If we can find a way to get rid of those I'm capital gains, create a mutual fund called the net neutral capital gains strategy fund. The purpose of this fund cash. is to return absolutely zero. Well, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say it's a net. Uh, there's there's a marketing way in there somewhere. Net right? capital gains aversion strategy. There you go. Yes. Yes. Since everything reverts to the mean anyway, we're just going to play the mean. Yes, we will play the average. <laughs> we'll take zero. <laughs> and we're not talking about the average for anything except zero. Well, we, we're just trying to not get taxes. Right. If we can pay zero tax, I mean, then we've accomplished our goal. What a big win is that? And we only charge two percent to do that. Two and twenty. I mean, we got to tell them the other twenty part, but yeah. <laughs> right. But since there's no, there's never any capital gains. You don't pay that twenty percent part. So we, it works we, out. It's a pretty cheap hedge fund, actually. <laughs> all things considering. 
we keep uh, we keep a third of the gains but the good news mr clyde there are no there gains. are no gains <laughs> so we all win together yes yeah yes. but there's no taxes so it's a win-win Everybody wins. uh travis I, I don't know i've never heard of anything like this and this doesn't sound like a rule of thumb you want to hang on to i've heard a much better rule of thumb buy and hold you hear about that one yes buy a lot early and don't ever sell it ever yeah amen brother uh, thanks for the question. If you've got a question like Travis had, head to stackybenjamins.com. And guess what? You will find at the top of the website a little button that says questions for the show. Click on that and you'll find the Haven Lifeline. And you'll also find a spot to write a letter to the show. we got a letters episode coming up soon in the next couple of weeks here. So we're going to tackle a lot of them. But we reliably tackle at least two a show. So thanks very much. Hey, thanks also to everybody who has left a review of this here podcast. It's always great to to read some of the amazing stuff people write about us, especially because uh, the Stacking Benjamin show is so much different than a lot of the other financial shows out there. This one's going on Mom's Fridge. Stop me if you've heard this one by Junior Midge. Says a jumper cable walks into a bar. Says jumper cable walks into the bar. Bartender looks at him and goes, all right, I'll serve you. Just don't start anything. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Oh, uh, uh, come on. Not in love with it, but I it get it. It says if you like this joke, you'll probably love this podcast. You definitely won't learn anything listening to it, but it's entertaining. I love a good dad joke. Thanks, Junior Midge, for that one. Head to iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts and uh, leave us a review, and maybe you'll end up on Mom's Fridge. Also, it's that time of year. We're looking at the end of the year, started 2018. If you're somebody who's looking for better financial planning, well, guess what? OG's taking clients, stackybedjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G to uh, get on his calendar and find out what it takes to get him in your corner working for your financial plan in the new year. All right, that's going to do it for today. Coming up on Friday, we've got Katie Brewer, certified financial planner, Katie Brewer, joining our roundtable gang. And we're also going to talk to Tim Yu from Pluto. And Pluto is gamifying your financial goals. So it's going to be a great episode with both Kitty Brewer and uh, Tim Yu from Pluto. We'll see all of you back here on Friday. Go Stacks and Benjamins. Sure, Joe. While you're busy regifting that meat juicer you got for Christmas last year, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned. First, share buybacks. Don't count on them as a reason to buy stocks, but also don't think they're a reason to bail on the stock market. As mom said after her latest Pull My Finger episode, nothing to see here. Second, take some advice from Jenny Bost. Go ahead and throw that holiday party. But relax, man, relax. And if you're a guest, pitch in and make it easier for everyone and maybe a little more fun. But the big lesson, don't re-gift Joe's mom's fruitcake. Everyone knows where it came from and you'll end up hearing about it from both of your friends down at the Sizzler. Just saying. Special thanks to Jenny Bost for helping us help you plan a better and thriftier party. You'll find out more about Jenny at her website, awellcraftedparty.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. The people responsible for this show have been sacked.
Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. I need somebody to go to Vegas with me this weekend. Uh, OG needs a friend. What's new? Is there something new? <laughs> it's not new, I guess. I don't know. I went to see a movie, dude. Okay. What'd you see? I saw this movie starring uh, Dan Stevens, who a lot of people know from Downton Abbey. Uh, and it is called The Man Who Invented Christmas. Humbug. So he's had a couple of flops. Well, who hasn't? You have a new book in mind? Oh, of course he does. My lamp's gone out. I've run out of ideas. Are we in trouble? No, of course not. I have told you not to disturb me when I am working. On Christmas Eve, the spirits pour into the night. Look here, Mr. Diggins. Pickpockets, streetwalkers, humbug. Those people don't belong in books. Charles! Come back! Come back! A miser, and on Christmas Eve, he meets some kind of supernatural guides. Does it have a title? Humbug, a miser's lament. Christmas ghost story, Christmas song, Christmas ballad, something like that. Get the name right, and the character will appear. Scratch, Scrooge. Come on, Scrooge. Shut the window. You think I'm made of money, Mr. Scrooge? How delightful to meet you, sir. Sorry, I can't say the same. You and I are going to do wonderful things together. And, of course, uh, after he invents Scrooge, the whole thing falls into place. We know the end of that story because of Christmas Carol, one of the biggest Christmas successes of all time. At the time, Charles Dickens had struggled through some flops. He was spending money hand over fist kind of lying to everybody that he was in wasn't in trouble and he really was in financial trouble and had to figure out a way to get himself out of trouble so this mostly biographical story of the creation of a christmas carol as i mentioned stars dan stevens and keeps going back and forth og between a christmas carol and the stories that we all know from the christmas carol uh and ebenezer scrooge jacob marley and company the three ghosts and walks you through how those came to be And at the same point, drawing the parallels to what was really going on in Dickens' life and how he was taking stories from his life to create the epic work. I thought this was an amazing movie. Absolutely loved it. It's been a long time since there's been a movie that I would call a Christmas classic. I think the last Christmas classic, somebody might call me out on this and I might, you know, have to agree, but I think Elf. I can't think of a movie since Elf, which is really stuck with us. Can you think of any Christmas movie since Elf that's really been like one that you're going to want to watch again or really exemplifies? I like Family Man. Family Man was before Elf, wasn't it? I don't don't know. Elf was 2003, I think. So Yeah, I think Family Man was before that. That's the one with uh, Tia Leone and... uh, Yeah, Nicolas Cage. And Nicolas Cage. Yeah, I believe I just like the Ferrari he drives in it. I believe that was (laughs) 19. It's all about the Ferrari. (laughs) Yeah. Who cares about that whole holiday story? Yeah. When was Miracle on 34th Street? Is that relatively uh, new? That, that, that might be before, slightly before. Slightly before. Yes, could be. Uh, maybe maybe White Christmas? Yeah, right. Die Hard 6? When was <laughs> Die Hard 6 out? <laughs> now, there it is. That's that's the one. <laughs> that's the Christmas one that stuck around. Yeah, I really enjoyed this good family movie. I liked watching it at the theater, although I think that it's going to translate well to the small screen. So I would uh, highly recommend The Man Who Invented Christmas. Big thumb up. Cool. I like it. Yeah, that's that's that. Oh, uh, we were going to we were going to talk about you just got your movie pass and I just used mine for the first time. For, so for those of you new to Stacking Benjamins, there's this thing called movie pass. It's 10 bucks a month and you can see 92 percent of the theaters in the country accept it and uh, or works with. They don't have to accept it. It just works with 92 percent of the theaters out there. And uh, you use your movie pass and you get to go for free, any 2D movie. Well, you pay 10 bucks a month to movie pass and this lets you in. I didn't realize how it works. So I thought we'd go over how this thing works because you haven't used yours yet, right? Nope. So we have this card. Looks like a credit card. In fact, it says MasterCard right on it. It has a MasterCard number and the little hologram. Doesn't have a chip. So it's a swipe card. But you get within a few feet of the movie theater and you go to the movie pass app Obviously, it works with your GPS so that it knows that you're at the theater because we tried to check in early and it wouldn't let us. It said, nope, you're not close enough to the theater. 
Do you have any e-ticket theaters by you? Because mine has e-tickets where it says, yeah, just buy the e-ticket, pick your seat. You don't even need to use this. Like when I pulled up on my phone. Oh, sweet. No, that is sweet. Yeah. Yeah, because I was wondering about that because when we went to see The Man Who Invented Christmas, we had like the, you know, four rotten seats to see that because the, the theater was packed. Yeah. But all we did then, we just clicked on the, the little button that said that we were there and uh, walked up, used it like it was a credit card. The first time that I used it, I actually asked the person, I said, oh, it's my first time using this. Do you know how it works? They go, nope. And then I looked and I saw it said MasterCard. Huh, must work like a MasterCard. So apparently they turn this thing on the second they approve it long enough for you to buy the ticket and then they turn it off. So super easy. And, just easy, uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you could just, if you could just make it work for the popcorn and. Well, and that is the thing. Like, I think I'm saving all that money, and then it's you know ninety seven dollars and fifty cents at the concession stand. If you do you know that. what, I don't even, I, I don't do that though. Good. Well, that's good. I, maybe I'll get a, a thing of peanut M and M's or something. I'm a big fan of popcorn. I'm a big yeah. fan of movie popcorn, movie theater I popcorn. I just don't, I just don't care for popcorn it's, that much. Uh, I might have some if somebody else has some, but I I won't I won't go out of my way to buy it. You're a communist. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of all the people on this show, you're right. <laughs> so that's me, the communist. <laughs> <laughs> communist, popcorn hating communist. Yep. Yeah. That's me. All right. Uh that's movie pass. Highly recommended. Good so I, I saw they're offering, you know, they're reaching out like they're advertising right now is hey, give this as a gift. And uh you get like a little bit off if you give it as a gift. Talked about Using you can't it. give it as a gift to yourself. Yeah. How about did you, that? Did you get one for uh, for Cheryl? Yes. Yeah. So you guys both have them and you just off you go. Yep. Yeah. So that'll well, be a good use of your money, I think. We were thinking about getting... <laughs> They're going to lose money on the Salsi High account. They're totally going to lose money on us. How many new movies do we see all the time? In fact, at one time, you and I talked about having Cinemark sponsor the, sponsor the show. If I didn't rip them constantly about what a crap company they are, we might have a shot with them. But uh, Movie Pass, if you want to sponsor the show, we are all about this now. All right. If you go see right, movies. Buddy, until we until we meet again. Yeah. See you next see week. You. So everybody back here on Friday. Bye bye.